Hello lovely people, I'm K3N and welcome to week 11 of the Slow Stitch Along for 2024. Um, this week I'm going to look at Kowandi, which is um, a technique of quilt making. When I first came across it, it kind of blew my mind in a way, because in the Western tradition of quilting, we're very much taught to start in the middle of a piece and work our way out to the edges, but um, with Kowandi, you actually start around the edge and you work your way into the middle. So that already was what? Um, the other thing about it is you don't piece a top and then quilt it. You, you do the whole process in one go and in fact it's actually not really patchwork at all. It's much more like applique, there I said it, um, but not in the sort of, you know, what, what we know of as applique, but uh, anyway, you'll see when we get into it if you haven't heard of it at all. Um, I'll put the word on the screen now, how it's written, Kawandi. Um, you will hear people here and there talking about Kawandi quilts, which kind of makes me go, mm, now that I know that actually the word Kawandi means quilt in the language of the CD people whose um, craft tradition it is. So um, I will try not to say Kawandi quilt. If I do, you can shout at me. So I'm going to just um, do a little bit of handheld wobbliness because on the cutting table behind me is my... Kowandi that I've been working on. I nearly said it, uh, my Kowandi piece that I've been working on. Um, so I'm just going to do a bit of wobbly probably, you know, just to show you the details of it. Because I wanted to do uh, a big one, you know, it, it's sort of four foot square or so, to kind of understand the process fully um, before talking about it to you, rather than just making this one I've got on my knee here, <laughs> a little one, which is like a mini flying carpet for a mouse. Um, you know, I felt I need to work on a, on a stop wittering, Catherine, just finish a sentence and then get on. Um, I just felt I wanted to make, you know, a sizable piece just to really try and understand the process because it was so different for me. Anyway, that's enough of that wittering. I'll show you the piece on the desk. The um, Kowandi inspired piece. I haven't got the microphone on, so I hope you can hear me okay. I'm as close as I can to the, the camera. Um, I followed the traditional way of making it as closely as possible. The only exception was I didn't turn the edges under, which is quite a huge exception. Um, but I did go entire one entire round, and I just wasn't enjoying the process of, of folding and turning and stitching through the folds. So I took it all off again and um, went back and did it all raw edge. Sorry, I'm trying not to wobble. Um, except for the very outer edge where I did turn under. Do you see there? So I turned under the edges and it's all kinds of scraps in the sort of, you know, my typical muted um, palette. I did my little foolers on the corner with some of my dad's silk shirt. I'll just show you a little bit on the back. I used all kinds of different threads. Sorry, it's really dark and rainy at the moment, so I hope it's light enough. Um, I use embroidery thread, mostly three strands. Here and there I only use two strands. And the backing is a vintage um, French mattress cover. And it's lovely and soft, except for here and there I had to pick out little bits of, um, I don't know if it was straw or something like that that was stuffing the mattress. And you see it is damaged here and there, but there's so much stitching in it, I think it's, it's fine. And then uh, for the lining... There's no wadding in these traditionally, or batting. They use cotton saris, you know, old worn cotton saris. Sorry, I'm trying not to make a shadow. Um, I don't have those, so I'm still still making a shadow. Um, so for my lining, I, I have got lots of vintage sheets, so I use two layers of really fine, you know, almost worn out cotton sheet as my lining. So I've just got this tiny little place in the middle to, to finish. It's been wonderful to make. I'm already wanting to make another one. It's really, the process is wonderful, um, really enjoyable. Um, so anyway, that's mine. It's about about four feet square, something like that, maybe big. It's just the size that my, my mattress cover was. And um, just as a little bonus, I'll just scan over here a little bit and show you Fred Fred. <laughs> Fred Fred sleeping on the chair. OK, so let's go and get on with uh, the week's project. OK, so here I am at my desk and before I start I'll just talk you through what you'll need in case you want to, you know, pause me and get your supplies and stitch along with me. Um, I'm going to do a kind of miniature version of what I just showed you, my, my big Kowandi, 
it's not the proper way, the traditional way to do it. Because in miniature, if I start folding edge in, edges under and so on, it's just going to be, you know, unworkable. And also, like I said, I preferred personally the process of doing it raw edge. I am going to point you in the right direction if you want to learn how to do it properly. So this is very much Sidi, a Sidi inspired Kawandi rather than a Kawandi. You know, disclaimer over. Okay, so what you will need is something for um, a foundation. And I've just got a bit of sheet. And in terms of size, I am going to turn the outer edges under. So my piece is um, about five by seven, six and a half, something like that, because I want my finished piece to fit in my journal. And I'm going to turn half an inch under, so it'll end up somewhere in the region of six by four, slightly less. And then you'll need a smaller piece um, to represent the lining. Now I've got this really worn bit of sheet and it's sort of, you know, slightly less than an inch smaller, but you can cut that to size. If you just get a scrap ready, you can cut that to size because you add that after you've stitched the first round. So that represents the lining. And then you'll need some little squares for your fula. I mentioned fula just now without telling you what they are. Fula means flower, and it's a little um, square that's folded across the diagonal twice, and then it's inserted into the corners like that of the quilt you know, like there, like you see there, how I've done there. And um, they believe that without the fula, the quilt is naked, so you have to put those in. And they're actually traditionally included on the first round. They're not added at the end, so I'm going to do it like that as well. I've got four squares the same. I suppose there's no reason why you couldn't have four different squares, you know. And I've got sari silk just because I have it. It's not by any means obligatory. If you've got some cotton, then that's fine. Um, those are about two inches square. I think, again, that's variable on my big quilt. I think there were three inches, but, you know, you could just get a square and fold it and see whether you like the size of it in relation to the, the size of your piece that you're making. Um, then you need some scraps of cloth, and this is pretty much some of the leftovers from the piece I made over there. There's, there's way too much there, but I just pulled out a handful. Um, we're going to be working with teeny tiny pieces because we're working in miniature. Um, and then you'll need some scissors, um, a needle, and some thread. And I'm going to use embroidery thread, embroidery floss, and I'm going to just use two strands because it's so small. Um, but, you know, you can use any thread you want. And I may go into different colours if I run out. Again, I think that's up to you. Use what you have. So, OK, so let's get started. Um, so, like I said, you start with only your base piece. And um, traditionally, I have read that they work anti-clockwise. But I, and I worked anti-clockwise kind of intuitively because I'm right-handed. Um, but I think probably if you were left-handed, it would make more sense to work clockwise. But anyway, so I'm going to start in a corner. So for me, that's the top right-hand corner. And I'm going to fold this in and fold it in again. And on this little piece, I'm going with a half-inch fold. On my bigger piece, I folded in, I think, you know, three-quarters or an inch even of the edges. And... Um, <clears throat> I also cheated, again, it's not traditional, but when I folded my edges in, I tacked it all the way around just with big, you know, normal tacking stitches, just because it was one less thing to worry about. But for this little piece, we should be good. So I'm just gonna pick a bit of cloth at random, <laughs> she said, carefully choosing, as always. Uh, let's have this bit. I'm gonna use sort of small bits, hopefully, so that I can get a few on. And again, I'm going to turn over the outer edge, but only on this first round. So I'm turning under there, what's that, sort of a good quarter inch, and just finger pressing it. And then I'm going to turn it under again on the right hand side, because this is to sit up in that corner, and finger press it. And then I'm going to do this and this. Do you see, so you've got a lot of folds to hold at the same time, which on this little piece is, is doable. Um, of course you could use pins if you wanted to. I actually found with my large piece, I didn't really need to use pins once I'd, you know, taken the time to tack this down. And then you start stitching. I've got a knotted bit of floss here. Um, and on this, for this first one, you want to start, you need to leave a gap because you need to get your fula in when you come back round. So I'm going to start in about half an inch away from that edge. In fact, I think I am just going to come through that very edge of that fold, I hope you can see. 
of that top cloth just so it doesn't flip out on me. And I'll just let my knot be hidden in there somewhere. And then you want to stitch as close to the edge as you can. You match those two folded edges completely up to each other. And on my large quilt I did um, sort of a quarter of an inch on the front and a half an inch on the back for my stitches, which is traditional that you have a small, smaller stitch on the front and a bigger stitch on the back. Um, but again, I would say, you know, we're working, we're, we're being inspired by this. We're not trying to replicate entirely. Um, so you do you. And on a little piece like this, you know, you might find that smaller stitches make more sense. So I'm now going to stop there. I've only got two stitches in because I need to add another piece. So I'm going to get my next piece. Um, let's have a bit of this, although it's too big. And you overlap this with this as well. Again, here I'm probably going to do quarter inch, but on my big piece it's more like half an inch. I'm going to cut it. It doesn't have to match the same as that, you know, they all sort of interlock. I think I'm going to cut it down there somewhere and tear that little bit off. If you're doing raw edge, it's much better to tear than rip because then you get a nicer edge. So I'm just going to turn under what will be the outer edge. Um, if you were doing it traditionally, you would turn under that edge as well, but I'm not going to. And lay it on matching the folded edge to the folded edge of the foundation and making sure I'm overlapping the previous piece. You could go under or over, you know, you could have it on top like that or you could put it underneath it, just whatever as you go along, whatever feels handiest. And then I need to make sure I take a stitch over into that next piece to hold it all together. And same thing again, trying to have a small stitch on the front and a big stitch on the back, but you know. On a, if you are inspired to make a larger one, you'll find that you get much more into a rhythm. You know, on these little pieces, it's all stop start all the time. I really would encourage you, if you like this, if you like the idea of this, to have a go at a bigger one. Um, because that's the only way, really, I think, that you can kind of, you know, inhabit it. I don't know how to explain it. You know what I mean. Um, this is a bit of oak shot cotton, which is not the greatest for tearing, so I'm going to cut it um, somewhat. Squares and rectangles, basically. But if you want to, you know, experiment with other shapes, then go for it. Could, I suppose you could do triangles and things, I don't know. When I get going, and I don't really have to tell you what I'm doing anymore, I'll talk more about... Um, you know, more things to do with it and so forth. So I'm just going straight down there, can you see? So that my needle's piercing those two bits together and then coming along. I'm using one of my normal small needles here because it's a little piece. When I did my big piece, I used a sashko needle, um, you know, a longer needle, because then you can load two or three stitches at a time with those big lines of um, running a stitch. So I'm coming along here to the corner. So when I come to this corner, I need to make sure that's turned in. And then I want a piece to fit in there. Um, what shall I have? So I'm looking for something that's already, I don't know if you can see me fiddling about over there. <coughs> see, that's a bit narrow, I could do it that way. I could do it that way, couldn't I? I'll turn some of that under. So again, I need to turn under, because I'm in a corner, I need to turn under two edges, kind of at right angles. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, Stella was sleeping on the footstool and she just fell off. I shouldn't laugh. Are you okay, Stelz? <laughs> Oh dear, I'm sorry, she just woke up with a start. <laughs> I don't think she hurt herself, she landed on the, on the rug. <laughs> oh dear, poor doggy. Um, so you see I'm overlapping there by more than, more than before, but it really doesn't matter, I don't think. Um, my stitch is just about okay in terms of where I'm coming out.
Now when I come up to this corner, I need to stop just short of the corner because I need to put my little fula in. So I'm going to stop there. So I'm about half an inch from the corner. And then I'm going to take my first fula and fold it diagonally. And this is going to be tricksy because it's silk. And diagonally that way. And I'm not worried about all the fraying. If I am worried about it later on, I can trim it off. And I'm not even really worried, you know, do you see it's not lined up or anything? It doesn't matter to me at least. And I'm going to lay it on my end shot still yet. Yeah. I'm going to fold this little piece back out of the way. And I'm going to just sort of lay that so it comes in a sort of a good quarter of an inch in both directions. I hope you can, you can see that. And then let that piece go back over it and get hold of all of that. And now I'm going to probably chicken stitch, which is what we're now calling stab stitching. If you watched last week's video, and go through to the back, and then come back through to the front, right into that corner. Now, if you were feeling the need, you could do a few a few stitches in and out, you know, to make sure your fula was really well anchored. But I'm just going to go round. It's not. I think on my big quilt I did because it might get more wear than this little thing. In a book, it's not going to get anywhere at all. And now I've turned the corner, so now I need my next piece for here. Um, what shall I have? Let's have this. So again, I need to um, fold over one edge because I'm now on along the straight edge and lay it on. Get my needle. And I'm going to just move it up slightly, just so my next stitch goes down into it. And the thing is, you have to let go of the worry about what's going on. I mean, these are tiny pieces, so they're not really flopping about. But on bigger pieces, what's going on down here when you're working on a large one, you know, as someone who comes from the traditional Western style of quilting, where you have to measure everything and line everything up and all that, it, it's quite... A challenge in the beginning to let go of all that but it really doesn't matter you all you're concerned about is where you're stitching while you're stitching and not what's going on elsewhere you worry about that when you come to it and that was actually one of the things I loved about it and um, that really made you focus on the process and um, you know which is all in the slow stitch ethos as you know so I'm all ready to my next corner because I use quite a long piece there. So I'm going to turn that in. If you if you found all this turning in fiddly for this project, just go with you know I did this completely raw edge everywhere. Just do that. Don't don't you know stress about it. It's your it's a little entryway if you haven't tried Kawandi or Sidi style quilting. It's just a little entry point, you know, to see if it's something you'd enjoy, this little piece. That's what all these little pieces are. They're just little tasters, if you like. So if you're finding the folding and all that fid too fiddly, just don't do it. Just, you know, just lay them on raw edge and be done with it. Um, I'm going to trim that so it's squarish with the scissors because then I can fold that in, can I? Can I fold that in twice? Or is it too small? Mm, I'll just get away with it. So I'm folding in two edges again under a right angle because I'm on a corner. And I hope that it's big enough. Needle back. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine, you see. And these foldy bits as well, if if they bother you, just poke them down a bit under with your needle. Just like that. So that you don't stitch, you know, stitch them to the outside kind of thing. You're just stitching them. Now I've got a cut edge on the edge, but I'm not going to worry. So I need to stop there again because I need to put my fooler in. The other thing is I've got quite a short length of thread. If I was doing this alone, like when I was making my big quilt, I took quite big long lengths 
Um, I've got a short length because otherwise I'm pulling my hand up in your face when I'm stitching and that's what's making the camera go out of focus. So that's the only reason I'm doing that. If you want to take a longer length, you go for it. So I'm doing another Fula, which is spelt P-H-U-L-A. And I think I said it means flower. And I'm going to put tuck it into that corner there again, same way that I did before. Get the needle back and then take some stitches through all the layers. Chicken stitching. There we go. And carry on. And even with the raw edge, some of my patches, you know, on the large piece came out of alignment and so they're not squared off, you know, or wonky. You know me, I'm wonky. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. In fact, I like it. But I think that's one of the things that give the pieces such movement. Um, and it's just such a liberating way of working. I thought, you know. It won't be for everybody, of course. Not, not everything's for everybody. Um, but it was for me. And like I said, I do plan to make more. Um, what am I going to do next? Shall I have some of this blue? It's got a seam in it, so I do want to get that seam out. As you see, with this tiny piece, I'm going to make a couple of rounds and it's going to be done. So, um, if this was the only piece you did, it doesn't really give you the full immersive experience of making a kawandi, which is why I went with the bigger one. So I'm on the straight side, so I'm just going to fold one edge under and match them to the outer fold. Match it, sorry, to the outer fold and overlap. The needle, wherever he's gone, there he is. And go straight in through that point where the two pieces overlap to the back. And I can turn straight away and come back through. I don't have to chicken stitch. Um, nearly to the end of this bit of thread. My stitch length is a bit all over the place. Like I said, you don't really get into a rhythm. Or I don't, with these smaller pieces that you do. I keep going on about making a big piece. Don't feel obliged, you know. Um, so I can end this thread off. What I did was I just kind of made a false stitch through the top layer if it happened to end on the edge of a piece like that that's quite handy so I'm now between the layers with my thread and then I just took a couple of back stitches into the the lining you know somewhere so it doesn't come right through to the wrong side just made sure that the stitch was tensioned like that and on the big piece I just left my ends dangling but I think because this is quite small, I might just trim it a bit and get some more. Some more of this rusty thread. I hope you can see it against the, the fabrics. So um, what I didn't mention in my little piece of camera at the beginning was um, the theme for the week, because, you know, you know, I like to share a technique or a style or, or some some kind of textile related thing. But also I like to have a story or a theme or something like that behind it. And um, you can't research Kowandi for very long without coming across the name of Margaret Fabrizio. Um, I'll put a link to she's there are loads of videos of her online. Um, and her very personal journey into Kowandi and her meeting the CD people and so forth. I'll put a link to an interview that she did with um, a gentleman called Joe Cunningham, who goes by Joe the Quilter, I believe. Uh, it's a sort of 45 minute interview of him interviewing her and showing some of her work and so on. And I really enjoyed that interview. I learned so much from, from it about her and her journey and so on. And also she says something about 34 minutes in, which really resonated with me. Um, I almost am tempted to not tell you, so you have to go and watch it, but that would be mean. Um, it was about buying cloth for quilts, you know. She was a quilt maker for years and years. And then I think in her 80s she discovered Kowandi 
in an exhibition in San Francisco, and she was so inspired by the, the quilts themselves and also intrigued by the, their construction and she couldn't work it out and she took friends there who were quilters and they couldn't work it out and um, so she went she went to the area of um, India where the city people live the city people are actually African by descent and they migrated to India or were taken as slaves hundreds of years ago um, and this is their traditional craft Sidi is S I double D I S I double D I. Um, I need to trim this; it's way too big. But yeah, so that brings me to my my theme, um, which is respecting traditions. And I've talked about it before. I talked about it a little bit when we did the diversity prompt, where two of my textile traditions that have inspired me are um, Japanese borrow you know, borrow the art of mending with indigo dyed cloth mostly from the Japanese culture and um, Indian cantha where quilts are layered from old saris and cantha stitched together. Um, and I talked there a little bit about, you know, being inspired by cultures that are not your own and, and doing that in a respectful way and so on. Um, and I'll probably talk more about that um, in this video as well when I sort out my knot. And now I've just gone through because this is going to be under the overlap patch that's coming. But I've got this weird loopy thing that wants to poke out. To poke him in. Come on, talk amongst yourselves while I sort my knot out. Right, so I'm just buried that knot because I was, you know, luckily on a junction when my thread ran out. So I'm, now I'm just going to come through from the back of the patch, quite close to the edge. Like here. And um, actually, I'm going to take a tiny back stitch just to make sure that's completely anchored, which is going to not fit in with my stitch sizing, but I'm not worried. It just has to do a job. It doesn't have to look pretty. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so Margaret, um, having gone to this exhibition and been exposed to these, these quilts for the first time and not being able to find out much about them, went to India. I mean, you know, that really is commitment. I, when I come across something new, I trained as a librarian, and so I research, but I research by, well, when I lived in England, I would go and get library books, um, and these days, obviously, there's the internet, there's YouTube, there's Google, there's Pinterest, there's, you know, resources online. Um, Margaret <laughs> went to um, the area of India, which begins with a K, and I can't remember Karn Karnataka something like that where the city people live and um, ask them to show her <laughs> I mean you know that to me really is respecting the tradition that is taking research to the ultimate level to, to do that and um, she's a very inspiring woman I do highly recommend going and watching this um, the, the interview with, with Jo and um, the way she talks about the people and um, the work and then she went, came, went home back to the States and she made several pieces and then she went back to the city people with her work and asked them to critique it for her so that she could learn, you know? It's, it's a phenomenal story, really. Um, and um, she went through a phase on her journey of, I don't know how many koandis she's now made, but a lot, um, of kind of being upset that her work didn't look like the city people's work. No matter how hard she tried, she just couldn't get it to look right, I think was the way she put it. And then at one point she realised that it never was going to look right. It never was going to look right, you know, look, look the same, because she is not city. She did not grow up in that culture. Um, with the, she, said, she says, they see differently to me. That was, I think, the quote that really stuck with me. They see things differently to me. And so she just kind of made peace with that and, you know, went on um, making her own work in, in her own way, but still respecting, I mean, ultimate respect to actually go there and talk to the people that are actually doing it. Um, you know, respecting their tradition, but accepting that 
she had to do it in her own way. She couldn't do differently. So yeah, Margaret Fabrizio. Um, go and watch that interview. And if you really want to go down a huge rabbit hole, go and have a look at her YouTube channel. Um, I'm just fiddling about with my corner, excusing me. So I'm coming around again to my third corner. So I'm going to do that same thing again, tuck that fold in. Where am I now? I'm now behind that patch. I'm going to come up. It's very kind of intuitive, you know, it's not something where you can, you, you can obviously, there are tips and techniques and guidelines and ways and all that, but doing, doing is the best way to learn. Once you've got the basics, you have to see, you're kind of seeing how it's listening to the cloth again, in a sense, because this is not what I'm used to doing with cloth. I'm, you know, although I make fabric collage pieces, it's, I don't do it like this. Um, so you have to see what's happening, be aware of what's happening and um, react, you know, react and respond to that. And it's utterly absorbing. I mean, that, that large piece, larger piece that I made over there, I started it, I think, a few weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago. And I've been doing all kinds of other things at the same time because I've got this exhibition coming up that I keep banging on about. and. Um, also, I'm having to prepare to go to England. Um, but still, I found time in the evenings to work on that because I just couldn't not, I couldn't not work on it. It was calling me all the time. And it's something you can just pick up and you can just stitch a couple of rounds or you can... Um, I'm at it again, aren't I? <laughs> you don't, you, you really do not have to make a larger kawandi if you don't want to. Hmm. Right, so I'm coming back round to my first corner again. So that needs to stay under, that needs to stay under. I need a piece to go in here. And then when I come round here, I need to put my last fuller in. Um, what shall we have? What shall we have? Have some of this. This was um, actually some of my father's pajamas that I bought for him um, in his later year or so of his life. He was in in a convalescent hospital for a while, and um, it was very hot, and he was so hot all the time. And the convalescent hospital was next door to. I should be tearing, not cutting. Was next door to a um, a large supermarket. Um, so I went and bought him some shorty pyjamas because he was so hot and it was upsetting him, you know, he was really uncomfortable. Um, so I went and bought him these shorty pyjamas, so it was just a pair of shorts and a short sleeve top, you know. And um, this is from that. Anyway, now see, I think I want to put that one under those because those are small and that's big like that, but I need to fold that edge in. So that's, you know, you have to play with how you lay them out, how you, how you place them, but you do it as you go. It's not planning in advance. It's utterly absorbing. A bit fiddly here and there, um, but you know, right. And I found with the large piece that it was quite fiddly, and that's why I resorted to basting the the, ed the, the edge in of the background cloth. Now, um, if you are inspired to make a full-size one, <laughs> sorry, I highly recommend, I can't recommend it enough. I have watched this particular video about five times because it's wonderful. And you know I'm always mentioning this person because she is wonderful. But I, this particular video of hers, there's just something mesmerizing about it. And this is Marion on Marion's World. And her, uh, I think it's called Kawandi Techniques and Tips. I shall put a link below. Um, because she does do it more, more properly than what I am doing. <laughs> um, 
and she talks you through the whole process of a, of a large piece um, and the, the proper way to fold the edges in and so on. Um, so yeah, you can go and have a look at that. Right, I have to put my final fuller in, which is ready and waiting for me. Um, having said all that, you know, I'm banged on about large quandy and so on and so forth and immersing yourself in the technique and all that stuff. That's just me. And, you know, and, and Marion as well, apparently, from what she said in, in the video that she made. Um, that's personal, th you know, that's a personal thing. If you just feel like using this technique and making little things, like you can imagine that that is what I think they call the mug rugs, you know, a little coaster type affair to put your coffee or your tea on or whatever, um, or as a little table runner or, you know, something of that kind. I don't think there's anything wrong with that personally using a cultural tradition of somebody to make something else. I mean, I have made little journals. There's videos on here, um, borrow inspired journals. I don't think Japanese people made journals using the borrow craft. That was something I did. So, you know, if you feel like that's more the sort of thing that you'd like to do, then you can, I think it's absolutely fine to do that. I don't think it's disrespecting a tradition to take take it and you know, make it your own in some way. I think as long as you are aware of the tradition, and I, like I said, I'm a librarian, so I always like to know, know stuff, you know, and look things up. Um, it's a very, it's, it's a kind of sensitive area, isn't it? But, you know, I'm just wittering on about my thoughts on it. Um, right, so I've got my first round in, which is, you know, I've only got a tiny space now to fill, but I now need to get my middle bit in. So that is how it's traditionally done. So you put your first round in entirely and then you'd flip all these up and actually this would be easier with bigger pieces because they would stay flipped up under their own weight kind of thing. I might have to resort to pinning them. I'm going to just pin them like that onto my, um, my, my table mat cloth thing. If they were bigger, they'd stay there. Um, but they're not, so I'm doing this. <laughs> Poor little thing, it looks like a specimen pinned out on a card, you know, like what people, not very nice people, or people that didn't know any better used to do to butterflies. Anyway, so now I need to get this in here. It might be too big, I might have to trim it down. I think I'm going to trim it down slightly. So, sorry, I've probably gone out of shot. All I'm doing is trimming a bit off the edge of my but a raggedy sheet. You could also, if you didn't want to do this on this scale, just go on, you know, not, not worry about being authentic and putting a lining in. I'm just showing you, just trying to show you in miniature the whole process as, as much as I can. Um, if you go and look at Marion, she does it with um, cotton scarves that she's bought from a charity shop, thrift shop. Just tuck it in. Tuck it within. Tuck it within as a stage direction from um, Shakespeare. <laughs> I studied English literature at um, Sixth Form College, which I think is high school in the States from 16 to 18. And also from in when I went to university and did my library studies as a bit of, you know, light relief on the side, I did English literature again. Anyway, so I, I, I love Shakespeare. I've read a lot of Shakespeare and been to see plays and so forth. And there's, I can't remember what play it's in from, mind you, but it, it, there's a stage direction or, you know, a, a not something somebody says, but, you know, the stage direction. I think that's what they're called. It's tuck it within. But a tuck it is was a little trumpet. So the stage direction, tuck it within, is um, off off stage. Is someone going do 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 like that? Anyway, <clears throat> that was a major digression. So I've got my little piece laid in. Now on the big piece, again, once I'd done this, I basted again. Because also I used several pieces of sheet. I didn't have enough that was, the, you know, the full size. And traditionally they would layer saris in and overlap them and, you know, whatever, till it was a the thickness they wanted. Um, 
and Marion did that, like I said, with cotton scarves. But I just found for me, I just basted it all. I basted the sheets together and then I basted them in. So the basting stitches in the sheets can just stay inside. Um, the basting around the outside, I'll take it out when I'm finished. You know, just long tacking stitches. Right, so I've got my piece in. I don't need to baste it here because it's tiny. So I just flip everything back over it into place. And it just sits in there nicely and gives it a lovely feel. I would highly, highly, highly recommend not to use wadding. There's a lot of people, a lot of tutorials I saw going by where they're using wadding, which is fine. They're doing them. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but for me, the pleasure of stitching just through these few layers of cloth. I think if you started putting quilters wadding, batting, you want to if you insist on calling it that <laughs> um, it changes the whole feel of the piece and the whole experience of stitching it um, right so I'm about to start my second round of stitching I don't need any more patches yet um, traditionally the city women use their thumb to measure so they would make their second line they would lay their thumb on the cloth lined up with their first line of stitching and then they would put their second line of stitching a thumb's width away hope you can see that. If I do that here, I'll be nearly to the middle. Also, I've got quite fat thumbs. You know, my thumbs are quite wide. Um, and so I wanted to do that on my bigger quilt, but I decided it was too wide apart. So I went for, I just eyeballed kind of about half an inch. And it's not difficult to eyeball because you've got a lot of lines going on. So like here, if I wanted to stitch you here, this little patch, I'm going to stitch somewhere in the middle of it here or between that line of stitching and where my needle is, I'm going to stitch because then my, my next round, I want to stitch the edge of that patch down. So I'm kind of thinking, well, I'm going to put a line of stitching here. I'll come closer and hope it focuses. I haven't got a free hand to tap. Um, so I'm, I need to put a line of stitching here. So I'm going to fit one more line in between. And that's basically what I did through that whole um, bigger piece. Um, I just sort of stitched the lines where they needed to be roughly in the region of half an inch apart. But if you want to go with the measurement of your thumb to be authentic, you do that. And the other thing you'll have seen, you'll see people talking about is spiralling in as you stitch. And, and that's not how the SIDI do it. They stitch each complete round of stitching independently. So I'm now back to where I started from. So my next round of stitching needs to start here. So I'll go this way, all the way around, and then come back this way. Do you see what I mean? So every line of stitching that goes around the perimeter makes concentric lines rather than a spiral. Again, you know, if you're happier doing a spiral, you go for it. So what I was doing was I was on the back there where my thread is, I was just poking my needle in just to the side of where the thread was coming out and then going inside the layers, not coming through to the other side, and then coming out so that I was sort of half an inch away from here and half an inch away from here. So I'm in the corner of my next perimeter, if that makes any sense at all, like that. And then I was going through the same hole that I came out of, more or less, to the, to the right side. And there I come up there roughly in the right place. And then sometimes I caught a thread and the little dot stayed behind and sometimes it popped through, but it doesn't really matter. So then you just stitch away on your next round with your rhythm of, you know, a smaller stitch on the front and a bigger stitch on the back. For me, that came to be about a quarter inch on the front and a half inch on the back. And I tried to line up, you know, as I was approaching the edge of, of a new patch line myself up so I ended up taking the stitch right over that edge just to anchor everything down and now I'm stitching through that extra layer and it's it's just delicious to stitch if you can describe it like that and I just did so apparently you can it's just the most wonderful thing to stitch through please don't use wadding you can if you want you know I'm not going to come to your house and shout at you Unless you tell me where you live, then I might. No, I'm just, you know, I'm, all I can do is encourage you. Obviously, you do you. If you insist on using wadding, <laughs> go for it. Um, what's that? It's a bit of loose something. It doesn't matter. So, just stitching along now. And um, this is, 
when I was stitching, you know, the rounds where you didn't have to add a new piece were lovely because you were just stitching. But then that doesn't become tedious as if stitching ever could, because at one point then you've got the fun of going choosing a new piece and adding it in. It was, it's just, see here I need to do a slightly shorter stitch to get myself in the right place. If I took my quarter inch, I'd end up too close to that previous line. So I'm just going to take a slightly shorter stitch. So I end up in that corner. Get out of the way, hairy little fooler. And um, I need to get new thread. That's the one reason why you need to work with longer threads when you're doing bigger ones, because otherwise you're stopping to change your thread every, you know, so I'm going to do the same thing again, take a false stitch, you know, or a stitch just through the top layer of the patch. And then now I can go into my, my um, not my wadding, my, my lining, without going right through. And you can do all kinds of things. You can knot, you can, you know, I was just doing a couple of back stitches and letting it hang. Um, because it's not going to hurt anybody in there. Although on this little piece, like I said before, I might just trim it a bit. And now I need another bit of thread. Um, this is quite a long bit, so I was taking it one, one, um, what do you call those things? One strand <laughs> and doubling it up. And if you do that, I would highly recommend that you double up the cut ends and thread those both through your needle. I find if I thread one end through, you know, and double it up and then tie a knot in the cut ends, that the thread goes through at a different rates and it ends up loopy. Um, I'll try turning my needle around because there's a front and a back. I learnt that here. No, I'm just, I'm just not good at threading needles on camera. Oh, come on. There we go. I move my scissors out of the way. So yeah, what I was saying, I'm just making a knot in the loopy end now, you see, in the double end. And I'm gonna do the same thing as before, come through from the back. It, some of my cloths were quite fine, so I didn't just come through the cloth because I was worried that the knot would pull through. I came through the backing, the lining, sorry, the lining, not the backing, and just did one little back stitch. Um, not necessary on this piece that's going in my stitch journal, but for a piece that's going to be used and washed and so forth. Um, I just thought that was a bit more secure. The other, that's what I found I used my need, I used my needle a lot. Here's the needle I used, is it that one? Yeah, that's a needle I used to stitch my larger piece. That's a very quite a fine um, sash gown. Actually, I think it's a quilter's basting needle, um, but it's a long needle, and it's bent now because I used it a lot. Um, but I found that much handier. And I, apart from using it to stitch with and finding it handier on the big piece, if my patches were coming out of alignment here and there, or you know the overlaps were creeping apart. I just found myself using the needle just to gently push them back into place. And that was, yeah, that was something I learned by doing. I didn't use any pins once I'd, you know, got around the, the outside edge. I just let everything flap and hang. And so, yeah, so now you're just stitching along. Yeah, what I started to say and then um, stopped. Um, about making other things other than quilts. You know, table runners, coasters. Um, you could make a Kawandi inspired cloth and turn it into something else, I suppose, like a bag or um, a journal cover. Something like that. Um, I don't think, I, I personally, if you even care what I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's maybe some people that might, you know, say you shouldn't, but I don't like the word shouldn't. 
people say shouldn't, it always makes me want to do it even more. Um, and there's a lovely lady called Jerry, um, and actually it was watching her um, after seeing Marion's, you know, Kawandi, full-size Kawandi. Um, I was watching Jerry where I thought, ah, yeah, I could do it raw edge, why not? Because I was, I think I was so in the zone of thinking I had to do it the proper way. Um, and like I said, I did one entire round with all the edges folded on my big piece there and was thinking, I'm not really sure this is for me, but I really wanted it to be for me and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then I what I saw Jerry's, um, she's done two, she, two videos, I think, on the subject, one with the edges folded and the other raw edge. And I thought, oh, yeah, of course, light bulb moment. Thank you, Jerry. I shall do it raw edge. So I did. Um, yeah. Right, so I've done my second perimeter, so I'm just going to start stitching away on my next perimeter. And on this round, I'm going to have to add more patches here and there. Uh, I'm just looking at the time. I'm not clock watching. I've been told off. No, I haven't been told off. I've been, I've been reassured not to clock watch. But at the same time, I do want to keep them, you know. I was a always aiming for an hour long, but I think now if they're an hour and a half or in the region of them, <laughs> I have to be happy with that. I can't seem to make them shorter. And you don't seem to mind, so. Right, so now I've come to this piece, this um, teal piece. Now this line of stitching will fall here. So then if I go half an inch away, it's going to fall here, which is fairly close to that edge. So I could do one of two things. I can either add a new piece of cloth onto there, a new patch of something, 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 and then come higher up that cloth. And so make sure I stitch, can you see? To make sure I stitch into the edge. Or I could adjust my stitching width so that when this cloth comes on over here and overlaps by its half an inch, which is where it should be, do you see, if I stitch there, then I'm going to have to stitch here so this end isn't trapped down. So what I was doing was just overlapping further into there. So I will lay that there like that and cover that and that. And then, then you have to be aware, especially on a little piece like this, but when you get more in towards the middle, what's happening here and here. So that's way too big, that's, you know, in terms of the scale of the piece. So I'm going to, f I think it's fine here. I try to move my fuller out of the way, but it's attached, so I can't. Um, now, do I want it to go all the way across to here? You can kind of audition by just folding that under before I commit to cutting it. And then I could trim it here somewhere, maybe. Do I want to do that, or do I think that's still too big? Um, I think I'm going to make it smaller. So I'm just going to and put something smaller in. And so then I'm just going to lay it on. So now I need to make sure it overlaps here and it overlaps here, like that. So I'm just laying it on, and then I'm going to stitch along. So now my stitching line will naturally fall right on the very, very edge of that. And here I've crossed that line, you know, they don't have to all line up that way. In fact, I think it's nicer if they don't. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. And this has got a very frayed edge under my thumb here. Um, but that doesn't matter, it's going to be covered up with something. Let's have a bit of this. Is that the right width? It is if I turn it that way. So that will need to come over there like that and over there like that. And I want the red rather than the cream, I think. So you're making all these little design design decisions as you go along. So it's going to overlap, or it could go under that one. I'm going to cut it, dear Henry, because it can then tuck under there, do you see? So we could if your big fat fingers weren't in the way. So just tuck it under there like that. There we go. And that, in an essence, is why I went to doing it raw edge just to take out that um, foldy business. And again, that was just me. That is absolutely not the proper way to do it. It's just what I did. 
in terms of raw edge for quilts that are going to get put in the washing machine, I have done it without any problem. Um, I am not washing my quilts every five minutes. <laughs> um, you know, I suppose if you were someone who was more hygienic than I am, maybe in that case I would make a tiny little test square. You know, a little, I don't know, 12 inch square or something that you could turn into a cushion. And then I'd wash that how I intended to wash the main piece and see if I, that worked, you know, and if it came out of the machine in a good enough state. But I have washed raw. I need to finish my thread off now and I don't want to know. I was going to do it on the back because I was not concentrating and now I don't know where to do it. Well, do you know what? I'm just going to do it on the front because the thread's the same colour as the cloth nearly. So I'm just going to do a couple of back stitches on the surface of the cloth. And then I'm just going to go in t between the layers with my thread end and um, bury it and snip it off. Right. And then I need another bit of thread. It's interesting, I think, at least. <laughs> about traditions and it's not only you know traditions that are not from your country of birth um it can be about your you know the traditions that are from your country of birth that maybe you don't know about you know lots of english people don't do english paper piecing and have never heard of it it's just you know d d because it developed in england doesn't mean the english own it and nobody else is allowed to do it and I think that's a little bit my feeling with um, all textile traditions. Um, uh, whilst at the same time feeling the, the need to respect. And maybe that's kind of, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I overthink things. I have a mug that claims that I do, that my husband bought me. Just wait while I overthink this. Um, but anyway. Right, where did I finish now? There. Um... I finished there. I can hardly see, so you probably can't. I'm sorry, I should have chosen a... So here I need to come along this edge and I need to put another patch on when I get here. Here I'm okay, because I've got this patch under. So I can stitch along here, can you even see, along this edge. And I need to stop here somewhere because I'm coming up to where my lining's showing. So I'm going to, in the interest of speed, not m mess about with my back stitch. I've shown you that. And not speed, but you know, just so I'm not here until a week next Wednesday, as my granny would have said. All right, Catherine, just get a bit of cloth. It doesn't matter what. Well, apparently it does. I'll use this again. If it's wide enough, it's not wide enough, so I won't <clears throat> use a bit of this. So I just lay it on, decide where I want it to sit, probably under there and over there, because that's a cut edge that's not very attractive. Um, and then with my scissors, being careful not to cut through my work, I just snip to make sure I've got enough overlap each side. Snip and tear. And then lay it on in place somewhat. Tuck it under, lay it over, whichever, whichever. And then just have a look at where I'm now going to be stitching. See here, I can't line it up here and here. It just is not possible. So that's just the way it is. It sticks out here a bit. It doesn't matter. And now you see I'm going to use my needle just to push that to be exactly where I want it. And then you can, once you've pushed it, your needle's in the right place to just go straight in and take your stitch and pull the edge of your cloth over because you were too close. Um, right, so I'm on my third round. On this little piece, it's easy to see which perimeter you're on and not accidentally start spiralling. On my bigger piece, I put a safety pin in the corner, uh, you know, my first corner, to be sure that I started a new perimeter when I got to that corner. Like I said, if it doesn't worry you, then 
just don't worry, just go, for, you know, just stitch and see what happens. But sometimes I find it quite hard to see once I was, you know, right into the body of it. Um, where I was. I think I can do one more. I'll come up a bit short. And I think now I probably am going to lay on my last piece. Now, if you've watched me at all before, you'll know that my last piece always takes me hours to choose. So I'll try and speed it up. Um, somewhat. And where do I need to cover? You need to sort of look where you need to cover. So I need to, I need to obviously cover that tiny little L-shaped bit of white. Um, so I'm just going to lay the piece on, so you, nobody, not even me, can see what's happening underneath. Make sure it sort of overlaps everywhere to cover that white. Tear it, and then fiddle about with it, whether it's going to go under or over. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and then of course you can't you're obliged because of the way the patches are laying if you if I go under here I'm going to have to go under everywhere because those are on top so I can't do that um, in fact it just has to go over it just has to go on like that because of the way the patches are laying so that's how it goes listen to the cloth so again pull that with my needle into the right place where I want my stitch to go next hope you can see what I'm doing I haven't crept away no good in and out and you see there it's flipping up it doesn't matter I'm not there yet if you want to pin it all if that makes you happy you do that It was quite difficult in the beginning to tolerate the flippy floppy nature of it coming from as I do, you know, the tradition of quilting in the Western style. Whoops. Oh, oh that's it. Yeah. Do look out for your tension. It does pull in and makes that lovely canther type ripple, but you don't want to pull it in too much or it'll all bunch up in an unpleasant way. But you'll kind of get the feel for it as you're as you're doing it, how how tight you should pull. Just have just observe what's happening. You know that's another key thing. Look look at what what the result of what you're doing is. So stitch a bit and look, and then you can adjust accordingly. You will see if you've seen videos of um, women doing canther, traditional canther, that they run a great big long. They take up loads of stitches onto a long needle and bunch the cloth right up and then they pull the cloth out and they do it the same with borrow as well I believe with Japanese borrow and then they pull the cloth out to the the tension that they want right so I'm coming around I'm just going to make sure that my patches doesn't need stitching on this round see there it's just hanging there it's held by one edge it's not going anywhere but if you want to pin it you pin it Although I will say that I did find if I tried to pin that I got bunching and wrinkling because the cloth couldn't move anymore, you know? Because when you stitch it, you change the tension of the surface. And um, if it butts up against a pin, it's a bound to wrinkle. Whereas if you just leave it hanging loose, <laughs> hang loose, man, hanging loose and free, it can go where it should. Um, do you know what? I've just done what I said don't do. I'm spiralling. Do you see that? This is now my fourth round. That stitching line should have continued to there and this should have been a new round. Well, I'm not going to pull it out, but um, that is something you have to look out for if you want to not spiral and be authentic. I could pretend I did it on purpose to show you, but I didn't. I would be not being truthful.
gone quiet because um, I'm listening to the rain <laughs> again. It was lovely this morning. Well, it was grey. I went out with the dogs into the woods. But it was a grey, soft sort of day. And um, I've come to the end of this thread now. I thought, oh, maybe it's going to be a reasonable day. Not that it would have made any difference to me because I have an inside day planned today up here in my studio. Finishing up some bits and bobs for my exhibition. Need to bury that in there somewhere. But no, it's raining. Go away, you. You did. Thanks for playing, but we don't need you. So yeah, it's raining. That's the news from Southwest France. Um, I was going to say something. Oh yeah, about respect. Uh, still about respecting tradition. Sorry, I haven't finished um, banging that particular drum. Apparently, yeah, because I was talking about your own traditions as well, and ownership of traditions and so forth. Um, I think one of the huge things about respecting traditions is keeping traditions alive. That was what I wanted to say. So if you if you le if you say I must respect that tradition and not do it because I'm not that person or from that era or whatever, then that tradition is in danger of dying out, you know? And now that the world is so small in terms of you know, we can all make contact with each other via the internet and so forth, and, and travel is and has been for some time, but, you know, travelling internationally is um, possible and not always affordable, but, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Um, I think one way of respecting traditions, and a big way, is to keep those traditions alive. And I think by doing our Kawandi-inspired piece, pieces and, and so on, we're doing that. Um, I don't know what the city people would, would make of us. Uh, Margaret Fabrizio talks about how they were surprised and delighted when she came back with her Kawandi that she was interested enough to do it, you know, to go away and do it and come back and, and ask them about it. So I don't think there's anything wrong at all, personally. You can disagree with me. I, you know, I'm only saying what I think. <coughs> with... Um, being inspired by other people's traditions. Now here I need to go along that blue edge and I think I just about can and still be in roughly the, the right region. But I might go slightly under an angle, but I don't mind. And I'm ready to turn. Now I've completely lost track of, I've got four lines of stitching all round, so because I've spiralled, I'm just going to have to go with it. I don't have a stop-start point anymore. So that's why, you know, if it is important to you, the safety pin idea was not a bad one, apparently. So now I'm just going to come directly straight up, straight up through the middle. Because I've been naughty and spiralled. And... Um, I need to finish off and I'm going to do that by a little back stitch on the surface of the cloth and if I was doing traditional quilting and I put work in a show with that I would be roundly um, actually do you know what I'm going to do that's just given me an idea I'd be roundly criticized and hounded out of town by the quilt police but anyway I don't think there are any Kwandi police so um, Traditionally, in some Kwandi, they would in put some rice, actual rice, under the middle patch. And that symbolises um, the recipient never having an empty belly, basically, you know, wishing, wishing them to be well fed. So what I'm going to do, now that I've done that accidentally, I'm going to do some little stitches. Now, I learned this stitch from Jude Hill, the wonderful Jude Hill, from whom I learned the invisible base that I use all over the place. Um, and she calls it a, um, a bead stitch. And I was kind of doing it already before I saw Jude do it. But I was doing seed stitches, but going over them 
two or three times to make them more defined. And then recently, in the private Facebook group, a lady did this stitch, and it's got a proper name. Well, Jude's name is proper, you know. I'm not going to argue with Jude calling it a, bead, a, a seed bead or a bead stitch. And it's called Granita or Granito, one of those two. And basically what you do is you make a seed stitch. I'm going to do this just in the top surface. I'm trying to not go all the way through. So I've come out there. I hope you can see because the thread could be a more contrasty colour. And you go as if you're going to make a seed stitch. But you come back up the same hole where you came out originally. Like that. So you've got one stitch on the spot. And then you come to one side of it with your thread and hold your thread there with your thumb. Really hope you can see. And then you go in through the same hole there at the base of the stitch and come out again at the top. And then you just hold that little loop. You just want it to fall in an ideal world to one side. Do you see? And then you do the same thing. Lay your thread on the other side. And you can go over it as many times as you like, but you know, once up the middle and once each side makes a nice density of stitch. And just try and guide that so it lays. And it kind of falls there anyway. So you get this little, looks like a grain of rice to me. Is it focused, hocus pocus? Can you see it? Can you see it? I hope so. And that's called granita or granito, one or the other. So just to, as a nod, I'm gonna go back in there. I shouldn't have come out there. I'm going to go and do another one over here on this pail a bit. Hopefully you can see it. Just as a nod to that tradition of putting grains of rice in, I thought I could do a few little granita stitches, granito. <clears throat> um, I'll look up which it is and put it on the screen now <laughs> to represent the grains of rice. So when you go in for your third and final time, you don't want to come out again on the same spot. You want to go over somewhere where you want your next one to be, like there. I'm going to just do another one here. Still got some thread left. And you can obviously play with how long you make them. And probably just squeeze one more out of this bit of thread. Oops. So that one needs to go that side. And then that one is the last one. And I'm going to just creep somewhere into a a junction between two patches, I think. Do you see? They look like little grains of rice, brown rice, healthy rice. I'm just going to hide my end under that bit of fluff. And then we're ready. And there's my little mini Kawandi inspired thing. <laughs> The Fula are quite big in relation to the Kawandi. I think they were more in proportion on this one. But anyway, they are what they are. I'll make some space and get the book in. Whoops, bringing all kinds of stuff with me. There's the feather. I love seeing all your feathers from last week in the Facebook group and on Instagram, people who kindly tagged me. Well, my foolers are gonna poke out, but I don't mind. Um, I've got my giant paper clip at the ready. I've started my second signature. I did actually, because I thought, why am I starting my second signature? I've got five signatures. Why am I starting my second signature after week 10? I've actually miscalculated, so I'm a page short. Also, this year has got 53 Mondays in it. So you, I have to come up with an extra idea. No, I haven't planned ahead at all. So um, I'm going to have to do something at the end. I might have to make a flippy out or stitch things onto my cover. I'll come up with some something to compensate for my miscalculating my number of pages. Right, I'm going to use this bit of um, normal cotton because it's in my needle. I'm going to get my little 
circle end is somewhat straight. And I'm just going to anchor this on the back first before going into the paper. Um, and while I do this, I want to talk about Wonky Wednesday. Now, I've done every Wednesday for the last few weeks, I've been doing log cabin related things um, on, on here on the channel. And um, on the last video where I finished making my journal, my log cabin wonky journal, I talked about Wonky Wednesday which is going to be a series of some kind. Um, <laughs> I'm very vague, I'm sorry. Log cabin related. So there'll be all kinds of things going on. There'll be me fiddling about in my little log cabin journal, making log cabins, which might be out of cloth or paper or a combination of the two. Um, and also on wonky Wednesdays, I might be looking at other kind of log cabin related things. I want to get into Manx quilting, <clears throat> which is very much related to the log cabin. Um, so there might, or there definitely will be a tutorial about that, probably in a few weeks after I've my exhibition's behind me and I've got more time. Um, but also I want to show you how I make things using the log cabin blocks other than journals. So maybe a cushion or a table runner or things like that, that you could then maybe translate into a full size quilt if you wanted to, in terms of how to join the blocks and so on. So look out for Wonky Wednesdays. If you're not already subscribed, why not? No, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean that. That was a joke. If you're not already subscribed and you like the sound of Wonky Wednesdays, please do subscribe and then you'll, you know, get notifications and so forth. It's free, um, but it, and it won't be a series like the, these Mondays are a series. Uh, I will endeavour to post something every Wednesday of some kind. Um, and of course, if you're in the private Facebook group, I'd love to see the things that you make following on from that. Um, But, you know, it's not... I know some people have made the log cabin journals because you've told me. So if you want to follow along and do the things in your journals and share, then so be it. But it's not going to have the same kind of format and structure that these Mondays do. But it will be a regular Wednesday, wonky Wednesday. So look out for that if you think that's something you might like. There we go. So there's my Kawandi. I need my pencil, which is not in my pocket anymore. I start off all organised and then it all goes pear-shaped. Here's a pencil, this will do. So I'm going to write under here as a reminder to myself, respecting, respect if I can spell it, traditions. And I strongly encourage you to go and watch the interview with Margaret Fabuzio link in the description and I strongly recommend that you go and watch Jerry and um, her Kawandi inspired pieces and um, I strongly recommend that you go and watch Marion and her Kawandi inspired piece. Oh yes, Marion also very recently made a dress and Marion makes clothes which I'm just in awe of people that can make clothes but she made a dress with a Kawandi inspired skirt so check that out because that's amazing. Um, but I'll link you to her main Kawandi video and if you're not already subscribed to her channel, if you go and look further on her channel, you'll find the dress. We are the 11th, I do believe, of March, which is the third month of 2024. And I'm going to hide my signature under this little fula. There we go. So there we go. So there's my little Kawandi inspired, hold it still Catherine, so that people can see. Little Kawandi inspired piece. I hope you like that. I hope you give it a go. Um, I look forward to, to seeing um, some of your work on Instagram or Facebook. And thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to you joining me next time for more Cloth Tales. Bye bye.